Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Jason Ruby Quartz Inman. And I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your mind university because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or set of eyeglasses from popular culture and teach you everything that you need to know about them in about an hour. Yes, and this week is going to be about Cyclops, the man that they call Scott Summer, the general leader of the X-Men. Like most of the time when the X-Men are around, this guy is the leader. Definitely. And we're talking about him because uh, there's a little serious called Death of X that featured this prominent X-Men character and it featured Cyclops pretty heavily had a pretty important event about him and it just ended last week uh, just to let you know this episode about Cyclops was requested by several of you so out there so many amazing TAs here's who requested the episode Andrew Lewis Perry Alan Mendez Robert Sussman Ron Pertry Sean Leary Captain Cuba Chris at Chris Punto 94 and Alex Isn Bowen. I think it's Alexis N. Bowen. Alex Isn't Isn't <laughs> Isn't Bowen. Uh, so Alex, both of those Alexes requested the episode uh, of Cyclops. So thank you guys for doing that. Because of because of those people, everyone will get to enjoy the Scott Summers tale. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just want to stay state something really quickly. Okay. I'm going to recommend that you all stay around till the end of the episode because we are going to have some spoiler-filled talk specifically about the Death of X miniseries with the artists on the book, Aaron Cooter. Say what? Say what? Indeed. And also say what? Because it's time for the Tencent origin of Cyclops. That is the first section of our podcast where we give you all the basic constructs, creators, and team affiliations that you need to know in case you go to that cool X-Men cocktail party and someone asks you, who's Cyclops? Yes. Cyclops, of course, is a Marvel Comics character. He first appeared in the X-Men number one in September of 1963. He's been there since the beginning. Yep. He was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. His all Alter Ego is Scott Summers. He does not have a middle name. I looked it up. Interesting. Yep. His, uh, of course, the nickname Slim. Mm-hmm. Some people will call him Scott Slim Summers, yes. but that is not his middle name. No, it's right. not on his birth certificate. His species, of course, is human, mm-hmm. but he's a mutant. And his team affiliations have been the X-Men, X-Force, X-Factor, and the Phoenix Five, also the Twelve. His notable aliases have been Slim, Slim Dayspring. <laughs> Yep. (laughs) Eric the Red, Mutate number 007, Phoenix, and Dark Phoenix. Okay. And his abilities are, he has optic force blasts, he has advanced spatial awareness, that basically means that he's like really good at knowing where a target's going to be ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, The reason why I put that in there is because there is a storyline where Cyclops is able, in, in the same fight scene, to blast Nightcrawler by predicting where he's going to teleport into. And also, he's able to blast Quicksilver because he's able to anticipate where he's going to zoom into. I reject that idea about Nightcrawler, but it's an interesting idea. Yep. And he is also a master tactician. Of course he is. So One has to be when one leads a superhero team. That's right. Let's go right into the meet cute for Cyclops. Which is the term that we stole from romantic comedy writing where we tell you where we first met this character and how cute it was. Ashley, how did you first meet Cyclops. Well, Jason, as a child of the 90s, quite predictably, the first place that I met Scott Summers was in the... KB Toys. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> the series, which hasn't aged that well, uh, the X-Men animated series. He oh, okay. is the leader in that he, he plays a very traditional... With his best costume. Yes. He plays a very traditional um, Cyclops role. And we had a lot of action figures that I feel like probably came from a fast food chain. Um, and we had of a, the X-Men? Yeah. We had a really? Cyclops one growing up. Oh, okay. But it was like really cheap. One and of we, our listeners out there, please go to our Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Geek History Lesson, and, and let us know what... What fast food restaurant made X-Men toys? I feel like it was a Burger King, but it, it was might King? be a lie. I don't okay. know. It might have been this Justin Canada thing, but I took the Cyclops into the bath and like the red of his mask rubbed off. Oh. So it was like just the blue So he was depowered mask. Cyclops. Yeah, he was really lame after a while. Where did you, Jason, first meet Scott Summers? Well, um, I first met him in the Uncanny X-Men series of comic books in the 90s and specifically the Age of Apocalypse. Mm. Um, I specifically met him in a series called Factor X. And in that series, Uh, He had long hair, and he was a villain, 
and he only had one of his eyes. Man, all the boys that you met in the 90s had long hair. Yep. Um, Cyclops, Superman. Now, you may be asking yourself, why did you first meet him in the Age of Apocalypse? Well, because it was through uh, my grandmother, who mm-hmm. used to give me gift sub- subscriptions, of course, uh, for comic books, and one of them was Uncanny X-Men, and there was like two normal issues of Uncanny X-Men, and then suddenly the Age of Apocalypse happened. Interesting. And so that's where I first got to meet Cyclops, and actually that was where I met him before the cartoon. I did not see the cartoon until after that series, and like think reruns. Oh, because really? I did not have a Fox affiliate anywhere near me <laughs> in Kansas. That's well, there you go. <laughs> I grew up in the middle of nowhere, kids. That's where I grew up. All right, let's move on to the main meat of the lesson where Professor Jason is going to teach us everything that is worth knowing about Scott Summer Cyclops. Now, I just want to warn everybody that there will be a lot of summaries mm-hmm. and skip aheads in this one because as long as there have been X-Men's and X-Women's, Cyclops has been around. Yes. <laughs> so every X-Men event, Cyclops is somehow involved in. So I have to skip some of those and specifically only talk about the ones that Cyclops has a part of. Right, because if he's just standing in the hallway when they happen to pass by or he offers advice for a single issue, it's not really worth talking about. That happens in a lot of them. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, When Scott Summers was a boy growing up in Anchorage, Alaska, his father, U.S. Air Force Major Christopher Summers, took the family for a flight um, in their plane. Soon that plane came under attack by an alien Shi'ar spaceship. Now, Ashley, right off the bat, do you know who the Shi'ar aliens are? Um, aside from being aliens in the Marvel Universe, not really. Well, basically, they're a monarchy um, alien species. They own the McCran crystal, which can alter reality. And they basically show up in a lot of X-Men comic books. Yeah, I, I was like, I was going to say that I think that they're the aliens that pretty much strictly deal with the X-Men. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they're like, we only want to talk to as the As opposed mutants. to the scroll. <laughs> now, as the plane went down in flames, uh, Scott's parents fastened him and his younger brother Alex into a parachute and pushed them off the plane, hoping that they would survive. Good luck against gravity. Yep. Now, Scott and Alex became were unaware that their parents had been teleported from the plane by the Shi'ar a moment before it exploded. Mm-hmm. Of course, comic books, right? Totally. Now, Scott suffered a head injury on landing that damaged the part of Scott's brain that would have enabled him to control his optic blasts. Mm. Now, this is a very common trope in many of uh, Scott Summers, uh, of course, origins. Mm-hmm. But I will say this. I decided to go with this version of the origin because Scott Summers' origin has been retconned several times. (laughs) And each time, they tell it differently how he landed. Somehow, for some reason, it's why he landed is the thing that they always change. Is the reason why he needs the visor. Yes. But the most common origin is that he bonked his head when he hit the ground and because they, they, they came in too steep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what... Gave him the head injury that won't allow him to that's won't allow him to control his octic blast. Did Alex bonk his hands and chest? No, Alex can control his powers just fine. I know. Because I know, if, I if know. Alex had bonked his hands, his <laughs> his his hands would always be blasting. Ah, oh, that would have been way cooler. Yep. Now the two boys were hop- hospitalized, and they both suffered traumatic amnesia regarding the incident. Because oh, of course, sure. Now a geneticist who happened to be Mister Sinister in disguise took an interest in the boys. Ashley, who is Mr. Sinister? Of X-Men, bad guy. Is that all you know about Mr. Sinister? Pretty much. Maybe we should do a Get for Lesson to Mr. Sinister. <laughs> um, well, Mr. Sinister, of course, is the guy in blue with white skin and a red diamond on his forehead. Yes. He is a shapeshifter. He is also a horseman of apocalypse. Oh, I knew that. And he is fascinating with the Summers, uh, of course, genetic line because he believes that the Summers can always create powerful mutants and he's always looking for oh, a way he's always looking for a way to get out of apocalypse's servitude oh cool yes. i've already learned something there you go uh i love scott's i i, no, I love scott summers but i also love mr sinister do you love him more than scott summers no <laughs> <laughs> okay uh of course mr sinister believed that scott was the summer's brother with the most potential so he had alex adopted to separate the two boys and thus render scott emotionally vulnerable Uh, to make him more susceptible to his manipulations. That's evil. Yep, that's why he's a bad guy. Uh, (laughs) Scott was placed in the State Home for Foundlings, an orphanage in Omaha, Nebraska, and there he was subjected to batteries of tests and experiments by the orphanage's owner, Mr. Milbury, 
who was also an alias for Mr. Sinister. I like the idea that there's like no home for wayward boys in Alaska, so they <laughs> move him to the Midwest. <laughs> um, as a teenager, Scott began to suffer from severe headaches, and he was sent to a specialist, again sinister in disguise. Now, can you oh, tell, Jesus. Mr. Sinister controlled <laughs> his teenage life. I can see that. Yes. Um, now, Mr. Sinister provided him with lenses made of ruby quartz. Soon after, Scott's mutant power erupted from his eyes with an uncontrollable blast of optic force. Mm-hmm. The blast demolished a crane, causing it to drop its payload toward a terrified crowd. Now, Scott saved everyone by obliterating the object with another blast, but the bystanders believed that he had actually tried to kill them and rallied into an angry mob against them. Scott fled. Typical X-Men storytelling. Yep. <laughs> and he jumped on an escaping freight train. Good for him. Now, Scott is soon found by Charles Xavier, Mm. and Xavier then asks Scott to join the X-Men, and Scott accepts making Scott the first official member of the X-Men. Can I can I take this moment to tell you a story about Ruby Quartz? Sure. So when I was a when I was a little child in the 90s, we had Ruby Quartz in our garden um, as like a decorative thing, and I was obsessed with trying to find the flattest rocks that I could that I could get to make them into glasses. <laughs> but <laughs> your mom is like, "What are you messing with all these rocks for?" Uh, probably. I want to be a mutant, mom. I probably told her, <laughs> "Mom, I'm gonna be a mutant." But I, I remember that like very, and they're they're more pink than red. Uh, I remember it like mom, vividly. Why are these rocks so pink? <laughs> I want to be a mutant. I want to have power. I want power so bad, Mom. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my Ruby Quartz story. All right, cool. Um, in Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, the X-Men, uh, of course, were this sort of paramilitary team. Mm-hmm. Now, Ashley. Yes. Do you know who are the five original members of the X-Men? Now, we know Cyclops is Cyclops, number one. Cyclops. Uh, Jean Grey, who was called Marvel Girl at the time. Correct. Um, Beast, Hank McCoy. Correct. Uh, Bobby Iceman. Bobby Drake, the Bobby Iceman. Bobby Drake, the Iceman. And uh, Archangel. What's uh, he was Warren or Angel? He War- was Angel. Warren Worthington the third. Correct, correct. Woo. Well done. Now these X Men were tutored by Professor X, and he trained them in the use of their powers in the Danger Room, which is basically like the holodeck in Star Trek. It's this holographic room where they fight things. But it's meaner. Yep. <laughs> Xavier provided Scott with a visor, of course, made of ruby quartz, to help him control his powers in the field, which he could activate with a button on the side of the visor or uh, in the palm of his hand. Oh, um, I didn't know that from the original. Yes, he has a secret uh, button. Cool. Um, as Cyclops, Scott became deputy leader of the X Men. Of course, uh, Xavier being the main leader, mm. and he was a, he became a skilled tactician. But Scott's social skills were very lacking. Scott Stop. had fallen in love <laughs> with his teammate Jean Grey, but his reserved demeanor prevented him from expressing his actual feelings for her. And this was an ongoing storyline in the early X Men comic books. This feels very like Peter Parker, Mary Jane to me, and even like the even. Both both couples kind of look the same. True. Uh, Scott Summers is taller than Peter Parker, though. And, and better looking, but yep. generic white guy with brown hair. Peter Parker is a short guy. Don't it, know. You should know that. Yeah. Well, now I do. Well, I'm, I, mainly, I'm, I mainly was directing that to our listeners. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Scott doesn't know is that Jean Grey actually had a crush on him, but he was too shy to make a move. And finally, on Bobby Drake's 18th birthday, they reveal their passion for each other and they become lavas. Brown chicken, brown cow. Now, soon Scott was reunited with a good old pal of his, his brother Alex. <laughs> his, his best yep. pal. When the X-Men <laughs> rescued Alex from a villain called the Living Pharaoh. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything about the Living Pharaoh because he's basically a ridiculous Egyptian villain who looks like a pharaoh. He's a living pharaoh. Yep. Um, though Alex refused the offer to return with Scott and join the X-Men at the time. However, soon down the line, the X-Men freed Alex again from Larry Trask and his Sentinels, who hunted down mutants, Mm -hmm. and Alex eventually accompanied his brother and joined the X-Men then under the codename of Havoc. Now, if you don't know about Havoc, of course, he has the same powers as Cyclops, except those same concussive blasts come out of his hands. Yes. There we go. And also, uh, Havoc's and Cyclops' powers don't work on each other. No, they don't. I really like that. They like zero each other out. Yep. Which is interesting. I, it's it's one of the things that makes me like Cyclops is, is the idea that he has this brother that's also a powerful mutant. Mm-hmm. So I bet Quicksilver wish that that was true about Scarlet Witch. Mm-hmm. Um, when the X-Men are defeated by Krakoa, who was a living 
mutant island. Sure. Cyclops is the only member able to escape and return to Professor X. He helps train a new group of X-Men, which includes Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Banshee, Thunderbird, Sunfire, and Wolverine to rescue the others. And when the original X-Men and later editions Havoc decide to leave on their own in light of the arrival of the other X-Men, Cyclops actually stays with the new team, feeling that he will never be able to lead a normal life because of the uncontrollable nature of his powers, even though he continued to date Jean Grey. (laughs) <laughs> so the original X-Men Now if you don't know about this This is a new X-Men in the 70s When of course Marvel decided to launch A new X-Men team yes, Because yes, the yes. original X-Men team Wasn't selling mm-hmm. But then their end story reason Was the original X-Men Were just like The mansion is too crowded Yeah it's it's very strange Yeah um, Though they weren't initially Working as a title As a unit of the As the original Excuse me The new X-Men were not as good a team as the originals, is what I meant to say. Well, they never are. Yep. Despite the very hard training that Cyclops put them through. And Thunderbird was killed in the new team's first mission, mission against Count Nefaria and his Annie men, and it haunted Cyclops. That's too bad. However, soon the X-Men made a daring escape, because the X-Men had to escape from to Earth from a space station when they were on board that space station during a solar radiation storm. <laughs> but the cockpit lacked the shielding needed to protect the pilot from lethal radiation. And Jean Grey quickly absorbed Dr. Peter Corbeau's flight knowledge and volunteered to pilot the ship. While guiding the shuttle to Earth with the other X-Men protected in the shielded part of the rear of the shuttle, the solar radiation then proved to be too great and she began to succumb to the radiation's lethal effects. No, Jean. However, Jean Grey did not die. Oh, the Phoenix Force responded to Jean's anguish and telepathic calls for help. It took the form, memories, and personality of Jean by absorbing a portion of her consciousness. And the shuttle crashed in the Jamaica Bay, and the X-Men were shocked when Jean came out of the wreckage unharmed and calling herself the Phoenix. Now, Scott Summers, of course, had no idea that the woman he had loved had been replaced by a cosmic being while the real Gene rested in a cocoon at the bottom of Jamaica Bay. And the Phoenix took Gene's place as a member of the X-Men and continued Gene's romance with Scott. Now, this is a major retcon. Okay. Originally, it was decided that the Phoenix was Jean Grey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, like 10 years down the road, they were like, no, Jean Grey's still alive. Comic books. Comic books. And she's in the, and they retconned. And she's in a cocoon. And she's in a cocoon. So, now you may be asking yourself out there, what is the Phoenix Force? Jason, what is the Phoenix Force? I'm glad you asked. The Phoenix Force is one of the oldest known cosmic entities in the Marvel Universe. It represents life that has not been born. Mm. And it looks like a fiery bird. Cool. Yep. Now, the X-Men soon journeyed into space to the McCran Crystal's homeworld in space deep in the Shi'ar Empire. Remember hey, we I talked them? about them. And there they met... Christopher Summers, Cyclops' long-lost father, who had become a space pirate named Corsair and leader of the Star Jammers. Cool. Now, Scott still believed that his parents had died in a plane accident and was unaware that they had been captured and sold into slavery by the Shi'ar Empire. His mother, of course, died very soon into their slavery times. That's sad. But Phoenix and Storm learned of Corsair's identity, and he made them the promise to keep the truth from Scott. Because that's, you know, healthy and stuff. Comic books! <laughs> now, Cyclops, at the time, he privately questioned his relationship with Jean, feeling that ever since she was reborn, this Jean was not the same Jean that he'd loved. <laughs> and for a time, even though during this time, he believed that she was dead. Mm-hmm. So Cyclops found a new lady, a new lady called Colleen Wing. Now, who actually is Colleen Wing? Uh, Colleen Wing is one of the defenders. Yes. She's an ally and samurai friend to Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and Misty Knight. Heck yeah. But Phoenix was actually alive. Oh, that's right. Yep. Comics. Uh, When Scott and Phoenix were reunited, he rediscovered his love for her, and they shared a passionate kiss on the way home. Phoenix blocked Scott's optic blast, giving him the chance to see her clearly for the very first time, and Scott and Phoenix shared an intimate night together. That's actually one of the moments that I think uh, the third X-Men movie does a good job at. Oh, recreating that he can see clearly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She can, Mm. like, control his blast. I think that's a very powerful moment for that character. Totally. But, of course, soon the Phoenix became the Dark. Phoenix. Dun, 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 dun. And when the Phoenix returned to Earth, she threatened to kill everyone. 
<laughs> but Cyclops still tried to reach out to her. And Professor Xavier was able to keep the Phoenix under control, and he helped her back to her ho- normal Phoenix. Not Dark Phoenix, normal Phoenix. Good Phoenix. And Scott finally proposed to the Phoenix as she was teleported away by the Shi'ar. That's clearly the most opportune time. Yep. Now, the Shi'ar had noticed the Dark Phoenix consuming a star. And the X-Men were forced to battle with the Imperial Guard, the protectors of the Shi'ar Empire, over Phoenix's fate. Mm. The battle triggered Phoenix's transformation back into Dark Phoenix once more, and Phoenix understood that she would never be able to fully control the dark hunger inside her. And she (laughs) sacrificed herself (laughs) on Earth's moon. I know that this is like a very serious storyline. It's a very important uh, character arc for Phoenix slash Jean. But when you said like the dark hunger, it sounds like the description of a romance novel. It's uh, They were very romantical. I, I can tell. Now, when the Phoenix committed suicide, Scott believed the love of his life had died and he left the X-Men. Yes. Now, Ashley, what profession did you think? What profession do you think that Cyclops decided to take on outside of the X-Men? Um, I don't know. A newscaster? I feel like it was some sort of teaching position. That's not bad because they're out of school, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not bad. Uh, incorrect. He worked <laughs> He worked on a fishing boat. Oh, sure. I should have thought more about Man of Steel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it didn't last long because he soon rejoined the X-Men to help him out. Just like us. Because, you know, we can always use help and support, which is the reason why we ask you to go over and support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Jawin, where a donation as small as $1 a month keeps the Mind University running. And guys, for $3 a month, you get to listen to these episodes of Geek History Lesson early. And for $5 a month, you get the Patreon-exclusive Geek History Lesson Extra, where this week we will be chatting about who were the best leaders of the X-Men and debating their strengths and weaknesses. So head on over there and help us grow because the more we grow, the more we can do. And in fact, there's even been talk of our Patreon support trying to help get a comic book going. (gasps) Secrets. Yeah, so if you want to be involved with that, go to patreon.com slash Jawin and we thank all of our patrons for the excellent support. Now, back To the X-Men. Back to the good stuff. Back to reality. Back to the mutants. (laughs) That doesn't rhyme. I don't care. (laughs) When you're a mutant, you don't have to rhyme. Oh, I guess not. You can do whatever you want. Now, shortly, Corsair came to Earth. You remember that guy? Yeah, Daddy Cyclops. That's a good name. There you go. (laughs) Thank you. He came back to Earth to help Scott... um, Deal with his feelings. About no, Jean. just to, just to help himself. <laughs> and Scott recognized a certain medallion that Corsair was wearing, containing pictures of the Summers family. Aww. At first, Scott was angry at Corsair oh. and Storm for keeping the truth from him. But Scott came to understand and soon forgave his father. Soon, Scott introduced Corsair to his other son Alex, and then Corsair introduced Scott to his grandparents. Now, here's the weird part of this: Corsair had been living in space as a space pirate for. A couple decades. Yeah, a couple decades now. And still keep in touch with his grandparents, but not Scott. Space, I am, um, space phone calls. Yep. Well, he might have thought Scott was dead, to be fair. No. Following the pink guys. Well, not after the X-Men came into space and were like, hey, Corsair. Well, he's a bad dad. What do you want? <laughs> there you go. Basically, he is a bad dad. At a family reunion of the Summers clan, Scott met Madeline Pryor. A pilot for his grandparents who was identical in appearance to Jean Grey. Yeah. But Scott was unaware that Madeline was a clone of Jean created and programmed by Mr. Sinister. (laughs) The guy who will never let Scott go, who has the biggest (laughs) Scott Summers love crush. I didn't realize that Mr. Sinister was kind of like this low rent green goblin to Cyclops' Spider-Man. Look. No, no, no. Green Goblin is low rent to Mr. Sinister because Mr. Sinister has plans within plans within plans. I mean, that's true. Like cloning your nemesis's dead girlfriend is pretty, it's pretty extreme. Yep. Now, of course, Sinister programmed this clone, mm-hmm. Madeline Pryor, yeah, yeah. to fall in love with Scott to make use of their potentially powerful offspring for his own purposes. That's so gross. Because Mr. Sinister had analyzed both of their DNA and realized that Jean Grey and Cyclops would have produced the most powerful mutant of all time. He's like, huh, look, there's Cable and there's Rachel. Shh, and- don't, <laughs> don't get ahead. Don't get ahead. <laughs> now, Scott began to suspect that Madeline was a reincarnation of the Phoenix, and he fell in love with her 
and he married her and he left the X-Men because he was like, I'm in love. Yeah, this is a Scott storyline where I'm like, you're stupid. <laughs> now, soon after he left the X-Men, Scott met Rachel Summers, yes. his daughter with Jean Grey from an alternate future. Mm-hmm. Now, Rachel called herself Phoenix and she wore a similar outfit similar to her mother, a fact that Scott actually did not like. He was like, why are you wearing that? What's wrong with you? I can do what I want, Dad. You're not my real dad. You're my back in time dad. I don't even know you. I haven't even you know, procreated to create you. <laughs> yeah. You're not my real dad. <laughs> um, now, Rachel was shocked to discover that unlike her own timeline, Jean Grey had died in this timeline and Scott Summers was married to another woman. Not wanting to disturb Cyclops' marriage to Madeline, Rachel actually kept her true relation to him a secret. So he didn't know that she was his alternate daughter. Mm-hmm. And a short time later, after that storyline, Madeline revealed that she was pregnant. <gasps> Dun, dun. Madeline bore Scott a son named Nathan Christopher Charles Summers. He's got so many middle names from a guy who's got none. Yep. Now, he was named Nathan from a Mr. Sinister implanted suggestion in Madeline. Stop it. That's awful. He was named Christopher <laughs> after Scott's father, Corsair. Oh, I was like, Chris Claremont. Yep. And <laughs> Charles from his father figure, Xavier. Yes. Now, Scott was away helping the X-Men when the child was born, and Rachel Gray showed mm. up and established a psychic bond with Nathan, swearing to protect her little brother as long as she lived. Now, for anybody out there, you've kind of always spo- you kind of already spilled the beans a little bit. But who I'm sorry. Who is Nathan Summers? Uh, Nathan Summers is a guy named Cable, who is a guy who Jason is very fond of. I like Cable a lot, which is why I, I probably because it's. Do you I, like him more than Scott? Ooh. Which Summers do you love more? I think I do like Cable better than <laughs> Scott. I can't believe that. Um, but I like. I think the reason why I like Cable so much is because he is Scott Summers' son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Interesting. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's okay. I love Scott more, so we'll balance yeah, it out. It's up. all good. It's all good. You know? <laughs> um, now, after the birth of baby Nathan, baby Nate. um, Scott and Madeline's marriage became strained, and Madeline <laughs> resented the fact that Scott was rarely home and that he continued to still miss Jean Grey. Scott started becoming very distant, even leaving Madeline in the middle of the night to go on X-Men missions, even though he wasn't a full-time member of the X-Men. He's auxiliary yep. X-Men. Uh, finally, the news came that Jean Grey had been discovered alive at the bottom of Jamaica Bay and that the Phoenix had been an imposter. Mm. Scott was hit hard and hid this news from Madeline and just packed his bags. And Scott Summers left Madeline and baby Nathan... Uh, despite Madeline's warning that if he left her again, like he had been doing mm-hmm. in the middle of the night, he would not be welcome back. Yeah, this is kind of like Scott taking up where his father left off because Scott is kind of a bad dad, too. Yes. Um, which is interesting because I think Scott is a good leader. And, you know, you, I would think that that would be a similar skill set. Uh, I would say this. Scott is a very bad dad at the beginning of Nathan's life, but he's a very good dad at the end of Nathan's life. Or, I think that's fair. Or in Nathan's teenager years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but, but to baby Nathan, yeah, Scott's terrible. I mean, abandoning a baby's pretty low. Yeah, Scott's pretty terrible. And this is probably, I would say, the... I, I know some people would argue that further on into Cyclops' career, he does worse things. But, like, to me, this is the low point of Cyclops. Mm-hmm. Like, like this is when he's kind of not a great character. Yeah. And he's kind of terrible. Yes, I would I mean, agree. Yeah. Um, Unsure, of course, uh, of what to do after leaving Madeline. I don't know what um, to do. He decided, I've got to go talk to Gene. I mean, that's not the worst decision he could have made. <laughs> um, so he met up with Gene, and the two of them decided that they really needed to do something to help mutants. But Gene Gray had believed that the X Men in the time that she had been fake dead mm-hmm. had strayed from Professor Xavier's dream. So they gathered the five original X Men, mm-hmm. who are Ashley. <laughs> Jean Grey, Scott Summers, uh, Hank McCoy, Bobby Drake, and Warren Worthington III. Otherwise known as Angel, Iceman, Beast, Marvel Girl, or Jean Grey, sometimes her name is her codename, and Cyclops. Yes. And they decided to found X Factor. Extreme. An organization that intended to seek out and aid mutants under the pretense of hunting down mutants as menaces to society. Yes. Now, the public assumed that they were humans hunting mutants when in fact they were actually training the mutants with the use of their powers in the X-Factor complex. Ha. Stupid humans. Now, unsure what to do about Madeline, 
the baby and <laughs> Jean Grey. <laughs> Scott Summers only felt useful when he was commanding his team. When he was in control. Yep. And Scott attempted to contact Madeline, but the number at their old house was disconnected. Mm -hmm. And at first, Scott tried to keep his marriage hidden from Jean because he's like, maybe I got a chance. Uh, But eventually the truth came (laughs) out because she's a telepath. And um, (laughs) that's so funny. (laughs) And Jean noticed that Madeline Pryor looked exactly like her. I can't believe it took this long for someone to be like, you know, (laughs) you really. I mean, like, you really look like Gene. Now, soon X Factor fought Apocalypse and his horsemen. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Sinister shot Madeline Pryor, who fell into a coma. And then Mr. Sinister kidnapped baby Nathan Summers. I think it's interesting that he shot her because, like, he created her. So, well, he didn't kill her. No, I know know that. I know that. Uh, Scott at the time actually thought they were both dead. Mm -hmm. But he eventually found baby Nathan. And soon, very soon, Madeline appeared to Scott. Calling herself the Goblin King. She'd actually fallen in a coma and when she came back, she sort of had more powers. Yeah. It's kind of a dumb storyline, so that's why I'm talking about. Uh, Scott was shocked to find out that his wife was alive. And Madeline, of course, started a fight blaming Scott and Jean for the misery in her life. That's not nice. Now, the Goblin Queen, as Madeline, attempted to sacrifice baby Nathan Summers atop the Empire State Building to permanently open a gateway between Earth and Limbo to spite Scott. Because, you know, people at the time were like, you know what our X-Men stories don't have enough of? Demons. That's like the best King Kong Ghostbusters crossover I've ever heard. Pretty good. Uh, Now, we soon found out that Madeline had been given life and awareness by a portion of the Phoenix Force that Jean had rejected. Sure. And that Phoenix Force had actually copied Jean's personality and memories. Scott had then programmed that clone, Madeline, to fall in love with Scott, planning to make use, of course, of their offspring. Mm -hmm. And to beat Madeline, Jean was forced to reintegrate the portion of herself that the Phoenix had given to Madeline. And in the process, Jean Grey got Madeline's and the Phoenix's memories and personalities. Mm. And Scott finally learned that Mr. Sinister had run the orphanage, the orphanage in which he was raised, provided the Ruby Quartz lenses and his role in Madeline's creation. Basically, wow. S- Scott learned that Mr. Sinister had been manipulating his entire life. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Scott appeared to kill Mr. Sinister with an optic blast because he was so mad. Oh, that must have been satisfying for readers uh, at the time. <laughs> but Mr. S- yes, but Mr. Sinister, we later learned, is basically unkillable. Y- y- well, he's a comic book character. <laughs> now, soon, uh, Scott decided to take Nathan Christopher with him on missions. Mm. Uh, little baby Nathan. Oh, uh, but baby. Nathan's mutant powers began to manifest as a baby. Wow. And and, and for those who don't know, in the X-Men universe, most people's powers uh, crop up around puberty because it's a time of high stress and your body's changing. Yes. Now, that should always already go to prove you how powerful Nathan Summers is. As a baby, his power, as a toddler, he's going to be a toddler now, as a toddler, his powers were already manifesting. Yes. Um, Now, there are some other mutants that their powers have manifested as well as a child. Like Nightcrawler. Um, Like... Franklin Richards of the Fantastic Four, who is actually a mutant. Fun fact. Yes, there you go. Um, Now, his powers at the time manifested as a protective force bubble whenever he felt he was in danger. That, legit though, if my baby did that, yep. I would like play basketball. Yep. With them. <laughs> and, and also during these times, uh, Scott tried to propose the gene several times and was turned down each time. Yeah, there's a there's a um, online there's a really fully funny montage of all the times he's ever proposed to gene. Mm-hmm. He's proposed a lot. Uh, now the writers of the storm kidnapped Nathan Summers and took him to Apocalypse's base on the blue area of the moon. And Apocalypse infected the child with the techno organic virus, basically a virus that turns you into metal, turns you into a robot. Uh, Uh, This virus spread rapidly through his body and if not stopped would kill him. A woman from the late 37th century appeared calling herself Sister Ascani. Now she claimed to be a member of the clan Ascani that had technology in her future that could save Nathan Summers. However, she only had enough power to risk one time jump without killing herself. Mm. Distraught Cyclops chose to send her son into the his his son into the future rather than wi- risk watching him die from this virus. And for some time after Scott gave his baby mm-hmm. to Clan Ascani, he had no idea whether his son had lived or died. 
Aww. He had no contact from the future. Now, soon after this, Jim Lee and Chris Claremont relaunched the adjective the the, uh, the non uncanny X Men as we call them, with two X Men teams. Cool. This was X Men number one that sold a million copies. Of course, has so many covers. Yes, you yes. can find in twenty five cent bins all over the country, all over the world. I would say. <laughs> uh, now, this title focused around two teams: X Men Gold and X Men Blue. And Scott became leader of a new team called Blue Team, while Gene served on Gold Team, led by Storm. Uh, Beast began began calling Scott the fearless leader, and Professor X returned to the school after a long absence. And uh, during this time as well, Professor Xavier and Scott asked Alex to lead the new government sponsored X Factor. And meanwhile, a mysterious soldier from the future called Cable reorganized the New Mutants, Xavier's junior mutant team, into an outlaw team called X-Force. Yeah, extreme. Now, Sinister sent the Horsemen of the Apocalypse to capture Cyclops and Jean Mm -hmm. and then turned the couple over to Strife. Now, Strife at the time was a madman and a rival of Cable. And during torture of Scott and Jean, Strife claimed that he was Scott's son, Nathan, returned from the future, seeking revenge for being abandoned from by his father. That's rude. And Strife claimed that Cable, who shared the same face as Strife, was a clone of him. So he's saying that, hey, Scott, I'm Nathan. Mm-hmm. I'm your son. I'm mad. Mm-hmm. And that Cable is a clone of him. Mm-hmm. Now, on the lunar surface of the moon... Cable and Strife both vanished in the time stream after a temporal device exploded. And Scott thought he had lost his son for a second time. Soon, Cable found his way back to the present. Mr. Sinister appeared and informed Cable (laughs) that Strife was actually wrong about their origins, that Strife was the clone, and uh, Cable, actually, excuse me, or Cathan, as I like to call him. Cathan. Cable was actually Nathan Summers. Cable soon defeated Strife and then finally revealed himself to Scott Summers and asked his father about his mother. Oh, after, after this time, uh, Jean proposed to Scott Summers. This was the for reals one. Yep. <laughs> and he happily said yes. And also it's like, I've been waiting my and, whole life. And, for al- this. and also he said, finally. Uh, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right. <laughs> Logan uh, sulking in the corner, <laughs> but, during the night of his bachelor party, Scott was alerted that there was an intruder in the danger room. Oh, good. And Scott found Cable there viewing a hologram of when he was given to the Ascani by his father. Originally, Cable was very put off by Scott's eagerness to relinquish his son forever. Now, if you don't know, Cable is like a 50-year-old man. Yeah. And this is, he's older than Scott. Scott is like in his mid to late thirties now. Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic shift because the the younger generation is the more mature person. Yes, uh, but Cable is an old man. Yeah. Um, and Cable, so Cable initially was very hateful because mm-hmm. he was like, "How'd you give me up so easy?" As any child would be in that yeah, situation. Yeah. So Cable finally gets to see a hologram. Of that, because the X-Men, of course, kept records. Sure, on holograms. Uh, which is why. And he got to see um, this scene, and Cable actually came to respect his father, finally, because he saw the scene for what it was, and how much Scott agonized mm-hmm. over giving up his son. Aw, so they so sort of kind of nice. So they sort of came to an equilibrium. Yeah, an understanding. Um, while on their honeymoon in the beaches of uh, St. Bart's, the consciousness of Scott and Jean were taken 2,000 years into the future by uh, the elderly Rachel Gray, who had then become the clan Ascani's matriarch, Mother Ascani, mm-hmm. um, after the Phoenix Force, of course, had abandoned her years earlier. As their own bodies could not have survived time travel, Scott and Jean inhabited new bodies cloned from their descendants. And under the aliases of Red and Slim Dayspring, Mm -hmm. Scott and Jean raised the toddler Nathan Summers from toddler to teenager. Uh, While Rachel, of course, was in a coma. Um, Slim and Red never told Nathan Summers of their true origins or who he was Mm -hmm. but this is very nice because scott summers got to raise his son he gets to be good dad now yes um after they return from their honeymoon uh cyclops and gene go to cable and reveal that they were slim and red dayspring and 
Cable was like, yeah, I knew. I'm a telepath. <laughs> Psych. <laughs> but he was waiting for them to tell him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they were pleased to be finally reunited as a full family. That's so sweet. Yep. It and he won't last because it's the X-Men. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, and he now considers Jean to be his mother. Uh, in place of Madeline Pryor. In pri- uh, yeah. I mean, but for, I mean mm-hmm. for all intents and purposes... She is. Basically. Yeah. Same genetic material, right? Yeah. Even if she didn't give birth to him. Uh, Back at the school, Scott and Jean moved into the former boathouse to be separate of the mansion and have Mm -hmm. their own place. And I think it's really weird, actually. (laughs) Well, I mean, you mean them living in the mansion or living in the boathouse? Them living in the boathouse. No, it makes sense because they're a married couple and they're like, we don't want to live in the college dorms. Yeah, but I mean, like... Whatever. They should have just had their own room, I think. It, uh, I think whatever. it was weird that they were, like, on the ground somewhere. It was also during this time that Scott offered Cable and his, for, his X-Force excuse me, a home at the mansion. And the X-Force yeah. move into the mansion. It's actually one of my favorite uh, X-Men, X-Force runs at the, of all time. It's, like, a really phenomenal gesture because it's one of the only teams that has not been started or headed by one of the original X-Men that's invited Mm -hmm. to be on the grounds. Well, it also creates this very interesting time where these two teams are operating on the same base and they their members start crossing over a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, This is also the uh, period. This is very close to time period where Cannonball, a member of X-Force, gets offered a position on the regular X-Men because Mm -hmm. they notice like, oh, and, and like it's one of the ideas of the graduation. Yes. Anyways, cool. um, also Jean Grey at this time began calling herself Phoenix to honor Rachel Summers, the alternate daughter that they had just spent like 18 years with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, of course, the X-Men were forced to battle their mentor and Scott's father figure when Professor Xavier was transformed into the evil Onslaught as a result of his attempt to mind wipe Magneto. Now, Onslaught is this big red and purple guy, but uh, he's this crazy X-Men villain, super powerful, basically evil Professor X. Got it. Although the X-Men defeated the evil entity and freed Professor Xavier, most of the Earth's heroes, including the Fantastic Four and the Avengers, were lost in another dimension for a time. And Professor Xavier was left powerless after Onslaught's defeat and was arrested for his role in the events of the death of the Avengers. Scott and Jean were left as the leaders of the X-Men and co-headmasters of the school. Now... Um, you may be asking yourself, how, Jason, are you not talking about Onslaught right now? Jason, how are you not talking about Onslaught? You like Onslaught. I love Onslaught, <laughs> and but Onslaught is like a 37-part event <laughs> and, and literally covered every title of the Marvel Universe. It is so massive that it could be its own Geek History Lesson. Cool. And, and if you want that Geek History Lesson, you just request it at facebook.com slash Geek History Lesson. Uh, same as the follow-up to Onslaught, Heroes Reborn, so massive It needs to be its own Geek History lesson. Yeah, yeah. And we have touched on some of the events of Heroes Reborn in some of our Avengers lessons. Now, at this time, after the death of the heroes, Scott's brother Alex was brainwashed by the Dark Beast, a leftover from the Age of Apocalypse, and he betrayed X-Factor. Havoc founded a team of mutant terrorists called the Brotherhood. However... Havoc did not truly become a terrorist because he joined the Brotherhood in order to stop the Dark Beast sinister plan. However... Havoc tried to kill J.J. Ona Jameson and nearly (laughs) killed Scott in a free-for-all battle. Storm saved Scott, but Havoc teleported and escaped later. And later, Scott also believed that Havoc was killed when his body was destroyed in an accident, but his mind was actually transported to another reality where Havoc was trapped in for some time, which became the basis for an amazing X-Men series called Mutant X, which I would also love and kill to do a Geek History lesson over. I love Mutant X a lot. It's probably the best Havoc has ever been outside of Uncanny Avengers. This is like a very comic booky idea too that like his consciousness goes somewhere else. Well, it's basically that series is all about um, Scott Summer Havoc goes into another dimension and um, he leads a team of X-Men in this other dimension and everything's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, also, if you haven't been able to tell by now, I really love Cyclops. And also, uh, since Cyclops is involved in so many events, this is going to be a long geek history lesson, yes. everybody. So, 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 settle in. So, strap in. Yep. Um, now, soon... Scott left the X-Men again after the (gasps) death of his brother. Like 800 times. Until a storyline called The Twelve, which we actually have talked about earlier, especially in our Apocalypse episode. Mm -hmm. So uh, go look that up. 
Now, Scott and Jean returned to the X-Men sometime at the request of Storm, because Storm was concerned about the mental well-being of Professor X. Xavier had been pretending to lose control in order to uncover a traitor he had sensed in the ranks of the X-Men, and that traitor turned out to be a Skrull who had replaced Wolverine. Wolverine? But Wolverine is all of our favorites. Why would you do that? Well, because it's surprising. That's true. Now... Apocalypse had made a bid for cosmic power by assembling the Twelve, a group of mutants who would determine the fate of their kind, that including Scott Summers, Phoenix, Iceman, Professor X, Storm, Magneto, the Living Monolith, Bishop, Polaris, Sunfire, Mikhail Rasputin, Nate Gray, the X-Man, and Cable. Mmm, so many. It's so strong that he needed two Nathan Summers. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, to secure a new host body, Apocalypse sought to collect the mutants he required to carry out his plan and siphon their awesome energies of the Twelve, and they were wired into a machine that would channel the Twelve's energies into Apocalypse, allowing him to absorb the body of Nate Gray, who, if you don't know, he is the Age of Apocalypse alternate version of Cable. Mm -hmm. I like Nate Gray as well. (laughs) Do you like him more or less than Nate Summers? Uh, I like him more. Oh, right. Yeah, he's better. Every new Summers we meet you, like more. Uh, Don't go that crazy. (laughs) Uh, Because there's more Summers we will meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, as his teammates fell around him, a powerless Scott saved Nate Gray and merged with the would-be conqueror to create a new evil entity. Because Apocalypse's plans were ruined, of course, when Cyclops was the being that Apocalypse went into and not Nate Gray. Mm -hmm. Gene detected Scott's psyche inside of Apocalypse and prevented the X-Men from destroying him. However... It, soon he disappeared, and Aww. Scott was presumed dead by most of his teammates. Only Gene and Cable refused to believe that Scott had perished, and at the time, Cable joined the X-Men to honor his father, even wearing a costume that only went over one of his eyes. He had a face mask, only yeah, went over yeah, one yeah. of his eyes in honor of his dead father. Yes, it's actually kind of an interesting look. I like that costume. Um, investigating rumors that he was alive, Gene and Cable found Scott in the birthplace of Apocalypse in Aqaba, Egypt. Another thing you should remember from our Geek History lesson on Apocalypse. Yes. Struggling to reassert his mind over the villain's psyche. Gene exercised Apocalypse from Cyclops and Cable, Cable excuse me, shattered the essence of Apocalypse. I like that shattered it. That's a very powerful idea. (laughs) Thanks to the support of his wife and adopted family, Scott was able to shake off the devastating effects of his merger with Apocalypse and rejoin the X-Men. Yay! Afterwards, Scott returned to the X-Men, but his association with Apocalypse had given him a grimmer and more serious personality than ever before. He got all mad and stuff. He was. He was angry. And basically, he was suffering from PTSD. Mm Mm-hmm. As a result, many of Scott's relationships became strained, including his marriage to Jean Grey. That's sad. And everything with Apocalypse made him question everything he'd ever known in his life as a whole. This led into Grant Morrison's new X-Men storyline, where the X-Men outed themselves to the world as mutants, and so did Professor X. Mm -hmm. And Cyclops had a psychic affair with Emma Frost. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It is a little weird. And soon, Jean was close to dying again. Well, that's sort of her gig, you know? She dies and she doesn't die. And as Jean Grey was dying, Scott apologized for hurting her. But Jean insisted that she understood and that she had never seen him more alive since Apocalypse and urged him to live on. Scott was soon devastated by Jean's death and he considered leaving the X-Men once more. But the Jean of an alternate future telepathically intervened in an attempt to prevent her dark future from coming to pass. Because what did the X-Men need? More alternate futures. Exactly. And she urged Scott to live and to allow himself to be happy with Emma Frost, the White Queen. She means, she only means that for like the next four seconds. <laughs> well, no, they're actually together for quite a while. No, I know, but it's not. Um, it doesn't last. Uh, Cyclops and Emma formalized their relationship. No, they, they're together for quite a while, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, and together, the pair rebuilt the Xavier Institute as co-headmasters as Professor X decided to relocate to Genosha. But soon... M Day happened. Yes. Ashley, what's M Day? M Day is this thing where Scarlet Witch is like, no more mutants, and then there's not. Yes. And soon after the events of House of M, nearly all the mutants were left depowered, and no more mutant, bu- uh, mutant, uh, mutant babies. M- mutant babies. I meant to say <laughs> births, but I said babies. Uh, and Professor X was missing. Mutants became an endangered species. And against the wishes of co headmaster Scott and Emma, the government assisted. 
assigned a Sentinel Squad 1 to protect the mansion and its inhabitants. With few mutants left after M-Day, Cyclops opened the Xavier Institute's estate as a refugee camp and allowed any mutant to enter, villain or hero. Yeah. I think that's actually a really nice move that really carries on the legacy that Professor X is trying to set down for the X-Men. Well, very soon we're going to start seeing Cyclops step up and do more for the mutant race than any mutant had ever had before. Yep, I love that. And soon after that, Cyclops found out that he had a third brother called Gabriel Summers. He's codenamed Vulcan. Thought you might like that. But he's, Is he logical? No, he's best forgotten. So we're going to move uh, on. Uh, okay. Uh, I know I know about Vulcan. <laughs> now, after the first new mutant baby, later called Hope, mm-hmm. since M-Day was born, the Marauders and the Purifiers tried to claim her. And upon discovering that Cable had kidnapped the newborn mutant, Cyclops ordered the reforming of X-Force with Wolverine leading the team to hunt down Cable and retrieve the baby. Yes. He's like, you know who should get the baby? The guy with claws. And the guy with the smelling powers. He yeah. can smell that baby. <laughs> he can smell the baby through now, time. <laughs> the search for the mutant messiah ended when Professor Xavier convinced Cyclops to allow Cable to escape to the future with the baby. Very similar to remember Cyclops having to let go mm-hmm. of his own son. Then the X-Men moved to San Francisco. If you're going to San Francisco. You're going to get to the line about the flowers in your hair? Remember to wear some ruby quartz over (laughs) your eyes. Very well done. If you're a mutant (laughs) in San Francisco. (laughs) You got real Italian on your Francisco. Cisco. Yeah, there you go. Uh, So he's in... The mutants are in San Francisco. Cool. And Cyclops' attitude became more kill or be killed at this time because he had had enough. He's like, I've given up so many children. Yep. And he reformed, especially to the future. Yeah. yeah. And and he reformed X-Force as a black ops hit squad while keeping their existence secret. Cool. But at the same time, Scott put on a air of trying to be peaceful to the inhabitants of San Francisco, even though at the time he was like, I'm tired of humans. He's like, I'm going to murderize all of you. Well, not quite that far. No, I know, I know. (laughs) Um, Scott had some mutants resurface asteroid M, Magneto's old asteroid lair, Mm -hmm. which had crashed in the Pacific coast a few, uh, into the Pacific Ocean, excuse me, a few years prior. And Cyclops moved every X-Men and allied mutant to the asteroid, which he now called Utopia. Yeah, I like Utopia. I do too. And during a press conference, Cyclops informed the world that they had left the United States and they were their own nation. Yeah. And that he rejected Norman Osborn and his methods because Norman Osborn at the time was in the head of S.H.I.E.L.D., which he had called Hammer at the time. Mm-hmm. Magneto soon joined the ranks of the X-Men, humbly stating that Scott had succeeded in uniting the mutant race more so than him or Xavier had ever done. Yeah, and you've, if you don't think that that is incredibly profound and that that proves that Scott Summer is one of the greatest X-Men characters of all time, you're a crazy person. Yes, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's in a massive move. And Magneto is like, so Scott, you you did it. Like, you united the mutant race. Um, what do you want me to do? How can I help? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Which yeah. is what Magneto did. Yep. And by the way, this also sets off Magneto basically following Scott's lead for like the next almost... Almost 10 years. Yeah, not an insignificant period of time. Yeah. Uh, Cable and the teenage Hope, mm-hmm. now uh, Hope's now a teenager. That's what happens with the babies. I don't know if you know that. They become teenagers? Yep. Geek history lesson for you. Um, <laughs> they, babies become teenagers. Yep. <laughs> they return from the future, and uh, Cyclops made sure they had safe passage to Utopia. Uh, he made their passage to Utopia the X-Men's top priority. Cool. While Bastion, who was a uh, evil government guy who turned out to be a Sentinel, made Hope's demise his number one goal. And Nightcrawler sacrificed himself to get Hope back to Utopia. Yes, he did. Also during this, Cable died saving humanity from a bunch of Sentinels from the future and angered at the loss of her father figure, Hope blamed Scott Summers for Cable's death. It, it really, it really. I never, I've never looked at this linearly before, but it seems like every summer's child is going to get annoyed at their daddy mm-hmm. at some point, and yep. then come around on it. Uh, and then Scott had to ba- to bury his son. Yes, but Cable comes back; he's not dead. Wait, what? Yeah, don't worry about that. Well, <laughs> when we get to the Cable uh, Geek History lesson, we'll we'll talk about. That. Cool. Okay. Now, soon Scott took full responsibility for X Force's actions and the deaths of every X Man since the birth of Hope, and he ordered X Force to disband. Scott was forgiven by most, but Hank McCoy, the Beast, left blaming Cyclops for an 
and he blamed Cyclops for Nightcrawler's death. Mm-hmm. And he also, um, he blamed Scott's increasingly militant attitude towards protecting the mutant species at all costs. Mm-hmm. But Commander Steve Rogers stated that after saving all of human and mutant lives from Bastion, it was time for the X-Men to step in the light. And Scott awarded, uh, Scott was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom from the President. Nice. Really nice. Which is interesting because the very next storyline to happen is Avengers versus X-Men. Can you explain this a little bit, Ashley? I'll um, talk about this a lot, but you can just really quickly, what is this? Uh, do I have to explain the Dark Phoenix stuff? Never mind. Just explain it. We'll just move on. Forget it. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Uh, we're just going to move on. I'm Cyclops and I, I was militant against you and I moved on. All right, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, the Phoenix Force is coming to Earth. They think it's going to Hope Summers. Yes, it's supposed uh, to go to Hope. Yep. And But the Avengers want Hope. The X-Men don't want to give her up. They fight. Phoenix gets to Earth. It possesses Cyclops and four of the other X-Men, making them omnipotent. Mm-hmm. Eventually, Cyclops becomes the only Phoenix, but because of this, he becomes Dark Phoenix. He becomes Bad Phoenix. And he kills Charles Xavier in a pretty damning scene of between father and son, because mm-hmm. Cy- uh, Professor X is more his father than Corsair ever was. Oh, for sure. And Cyclops goes to prison. Yes, he does. Until he asks Magneto to break him out. Yes. <laughs> and together with Magneto and Magic, uh, the the sister of Colossus. Yes. Cyclops went about liberating unjustly and imprisoned mutants and offering them help with their powers and a place on his team. Nice. And acting on an old ideal, he made the former headquarters of Weapon X the team's new home. Who's Weapon X? Uh, Weapon X is the organization, the pseudo-military organization that gives us the likes of Wolverine and Deadpool. Correct. Um, And after Cyclops found out that his powers were broken because of the Phoenix, he went about attempting to recruit other young mutants when he was eventually confronted by his younger self, his like 18-year-old self. Yep, yep. And other younger versions of the five original X-Men that Hank McCoy the Beast had brought back from the past. Mm -hmm. Now, Cyclops became both conflicted and tormented by his actions as the original five X-Men, including his younger self, witnessed what he knew they could see, even if it wasn't the truth. They would see him as a monster. They would see him as the murderer of Charles Xavier. Yep. Nevertheless, he committed to his mission, and he began to retrain in secret to somehow regain control of his abilities, as well as train his own students in the abandoned Weapon X facility in Western Canada Canada, that he named the new Charles Xavier School for the Gifted. Yes, I really like that he names it after Charles. I do, too, because uh, Wolverine takes over the Westchester Mansion and names it the Jean Jean Grey Grey. School. Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Yep. As Cyclops began to rescue more and more mutants, the people on the street began to call him a revolutionary, holding signs and t-shirts stating Cyclops was right. I own one of those t-shirts. I love it. And <laughs> he also began to sport a new costume with a giant X emblazoned proudly on his head, indicative of his mentor and his mutant revelation. Uh, I really I, I really like that costume. The Chris Bacalo costume. Yes. yes. Black and red. Later it was revealed that the reason for this alternation uh, was not because of the exposure to the Phoenix Force, uh, what I'm talking about is his powers, mm. but because they had been affected by the Dark Beast with Nano Sentinels. Once they removed the Nano, nano Sentinels, Sentinels from their bodies, they regained total control over their powers. Cyclops, after finally realizing what his mutant revolu- revolution is, he gathered all the world's mutants at the White House to show humans that the mutants could all gather in one place without creating harm mm-hmm. or danger to the humans. Yeah, it's it's actually a really nice gesture. Soon, some X-Men, even though they were reluctant to appreciate Cyclops' genius act, <laughs> they endorsed him, such as Nightcrawler, who'd come back from the mm-hmm. death, and his brother Havoc, and finally Magneto, who stated, though, even though Cyclops' actions seemed insane to him, Charles Xavier would have loved this. Nice. Really nice. And then... Secret Wars happened, which is basically Marvel's multiverse breaking apart and then being put back together. Mm -hmm. And then when it came back together, we learned that Cyclops was dead. What? And we had no idea how until the most recent miniseries, Death of X, written by Charles Soule and Jeff Lemire and drawn by who we're going to be talking to in very soon, Aaron Cooter. The awesome Aaron Cooter. Now, Death of X can basically be summarized like this. It deals with the pre-events of the pre-all-new, all-different X-Men. And basically, Cyclops and the X-Men, they go to Murr Island, and they find that there is a disease there. A disease that can kill humans made of the Terrigen Mist clouds. Now, the Terrigen Mists, of course, are the clouds or the mists that give the Inhumans their powers. Now, we don't think much of this because the story moves along, and of course, we get to suffer the death of Jamie 
Madrox, the multiple man. But later it goes to Cyclops and his X-Men trying to stop the Terrigen mist clouds that are traveling the world along with a minor mutant named Alchemy. And eventually it leads to a face-off between the Inhumans and the X-Men where basically Scott stands up to the fury of Black Bolt just to stand up to him and is obliterated. We later move on into his funeral and Havoc, his little brother, is talking to Emma Frost and we learn that the final twist of Death of X is that the Cyclops that we've been following through issues 2, 3, and 4 is not Cyclops at all. It's a psychic projection by Emma Frost because Scott actually died when they went to Mirror Island in the first issue of the series and it's this idea that scott's last words are don't let it end emma and emma frost is like i made him an idea and ideas can never die so it's this interesting idea that cyclops is now an idea that cannot be killed and that's it for the comics. Now, of course, you've seen Cyclops in lots of cartoons and movies. So let's just move on into recommended reading. Cool. Where Professor Jason is going to recommend stuff that you read if you want to know more about Cyclops. And you can find all of these recommendations and our, our entire history of recommended reading by going to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. There are little Amazon widgets. You click them, you buy them, and a little bit comes back our way to the Mind University where we harvest ruby quartz. Now... First off, I'm going to recommend the Uncanny X-Men Volume 1 hardcover. This is the Uncanny X-Men. This is with Cyclops with the X on his face and his mutant revolution. It collects the first 12 issues. It's where he's right after Avengers vs. X-Men, and he is leading his mutant revolution. And it's a fun series, great art by Chris Bacalo, and this is the most militant Cyclops has ever been. Yeah. Uh, Next, I would recommend uh, X-Men, The Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. Now, this is Cyclops and Phoenix on their wild honeymoon, where they raise young Nathan Summers, who becomes the man called Cable. It's a very sweet series, and it really connects you with Scott as a parent and uh, him being a father to Cable. Nice. And finally, I would recommend X-Men Messiah Complex. This is where hope is born, and Mm -hmm. they're trying to track down hope, and this is the beginning of Cyclops as the military leader, and this is where the chase for hope begins, and I actually think it's a really fun event, and it's really Cyclops stepping up to take control of the X-Men, because in that storyline, he basically tells Professor X to be like, you've abandoned the X-Men several times, I never have. I'm making the decision. Nice. So, all right. And now on to the discussion. This week, we are joined by an amazing comic book artist known for his work on action comics and now on the Death of Cyclops series, Death of X. So we're going to get deep into spoilers because it came out last week. And we're going to talk to artist Aaron Cooter. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for uh, joining us on Geek History Lesson. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, first off, I want to ask you, what was it like to work with two writers, Jeff Lemire, Charles Soule, on this book, as opposed to working on a comic book with only one writer? It's it's cool. I mean, both of both Charles and Jeff are on like that the that bucket list of creators that I've wanted to work with before. Um, it is a little more complicated than just uh, um, just working with one writer. Um, because as, as the art, when you're just doing the art duties, it, uh, you want to have what you draw and what you create visually sync up with what is in the person's mind that is, is uh, crafting the story set, uh, the, the word side of it. Um, and when you have two writers, you, you never quite, well, at least I didn't ever quite know if I was like hitting that, that sweet spot for both of them. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, you know, it, it's a little frustrating in that sense, but, um, ultimately it's, it's re it's, it's cool because it also adds that level of challenge. Um, and after a certain point in, in drawing comics, like you look for, what, how to push yourself harder and, and, and further. Um, and so being able to, to balance what each of them wanted and not necessarily knowing where their part starts and stops, um, was, was, was interesting. 
Um, there, there's also there, there's also a huge mood difference between the two sides of the story. Um, yeah, I, mean, I mean, in the in the human side of it, there was a lot a lot of more lighthearted, um, uh, high energy, and the uh, and, and with the X Men, um, it was it was much more dramatic, much more mood oriented. Uh, and that, that proves always to be the, the for me anyway, uh, it proves to be the more, the more, uh, daunting, uh, challenging visually, um, side of things. Now, I also noticed that in this book, Death of X, you did a nice little update on the Cyclops costume. You made the X on his head huge. And I gotta say, like, I dig it. But what led to you being like, okay, I think the the his visor, his giant X visor, should be larger than what it's normally drawn. Huh. Um, I'm not sure if I noticed that I did that. <laughs> <laughs> you, maybe you did it. Maybe you did it subconsciously. Um, Usually, a lot of the artists will draw it like very thin, and I noticed that you made it like bring up his whole head, which I thought was an interesting choice for Cyclops because then it made it seem like he was just this giant cannon, sort of for me. You know, in my mind, I oh yeah, I, I can see where I'm. I'm I just image searched um, the X, X face, as it were. In my mind, uh, uh, the thinner version um, it doesn't cover his eyes. Like it, the 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 red part doesn't cover in, envelop in, his entire eyes. So I kept seeing this like technical difficulty of like burning the edges of his costume when his Ruby Ruby stuff wasn't quite covering, uh, you know, if you, if you look at like, uh, I'm looking at an image of like, uh, I think it's, uh, the cello, um, doing it and where his eyes would lay behind the costume is the fabric part. And, and to me, that was just, the, that, that was, you know, that's, you know, it's, a, it's totally an artistic, uh, licensed sort of realm, but, uh, I, I like the technical side of things. I like solving things in a, um, how, how would it actually work sort of way. And so I, I, that's probably why I went with the big X face. Well, let's also talk about a little bit about designing the Terrigen Mist disease. Now, it's appeared in a couple other places, but in this book, like I thought you did a really good job of making it look real kind of gross. Um, and then you <laughs> well, you also got to draw uh, the death of Jamie Madrox, the multiple man. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, what made you decide to make the Terrigen Mist disease like so gross? And then what was it like to take out like a famous X Factor character? Yeah, and oh man, I didn't even know that was going to happen. Um, and that was that was kind of like one of those surprises where you're like, oh, I got socks for my birthday. I love Jamie. I didn't I didn't want to kill him. <laughs> um, so many of the characters that I got to draw, I'm like, oh no, if, if they're appearing, appearing in this book, <laughs> there's, a, there's a good chance they're wearing red shirts, if you know what I mean. And then it shows up that. Uh, that Jamie gets killed. That was, that was kind of heart wrenching for myself. Um, but, uh, as, as far as the, the way that, the way that drawing, uh, the disease went, I tried to, um, illustrate it differently for each, um, like it would manifest differently for each mutant. Really? I'll have to go back and check that out. Uh, so if you look at, if you look at some of the different versions of Jamie's demise, some of them are gaunt, so like uh, emaciated. Some of them are covered in veins. Some of them are covered in boils. Some of them are, are, are blown up to like disgusting levels. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was, that was my way of saying like, uh, giving, giving credence to the different ways that, the the X uh, X Pox or whatever it's called uh, mm. was has been rendered by different artists. You know, it, showing it having its kind of its own way of um, destroying each each mutant individually. 
All right. Well, let's uh, let's straight hop straight into some dead on uh, Death FX spoilers, like the big twist. Now, our listeners have already been warned, so we're just going to reveal it all. The end of the story, it's revealed that Emma Foss has been projecting that Cyclops was alive till the end when actually Cyclops died sort of at the end of issue one. Now, did you know that twist going in? Isn't that so cool? I liked it. <laughs> very, 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 very almost I, Fight Clubish. I loved it. Um I didn't realize that twist until the uh, until I was literally drawing like the pages right before Cyclops actually dies. Uh, so I found out it, when it was in issue one, um, and then that led to me taking those pages and reformatting them, redesigning them so that they were absolutely everything they could be. Not that I was trying to slack off before, but, um, but that idea of having those pages come back is so important later on in the story, uh, meant so much to me, you know? Well, that's another thing too, is I was going to ask if, um, once you found out the twist, if, pages that involve Cyclops in issue two, three, and four, if you went into them like a certain way, designing them to like sort of hint towards the fact that he's actually dead. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a scene where um, Cyclops is, I think it's in issue two or maybe three. Um, I think it's in issue three actually, um, where Cyclops is talking to Alchemist. Um, but really we find out later that that's Emma's projection of Cyclops. So there's a little panel and I allude to it again in issue four where Emma, if, if the first time you go through the scene, you don't notice, but Emma's in the background and, and she's, she's got her eyes like locked on alchemist. And, uh, and that's for the point of like saying later on that she was actually right there, mm. you know, in his head. Um, and I, the dog, so I think we're getting a, a FedEx delivery or something right now. It's all right. Your dog, your dog's upset by the death of Cyclops as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, lastly, Aaron, I want to ask you, um, I want to know, um, this is your first X-Men work, I believe, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, well, who's your favorite X-Men character? So I th- th- that's a really tough question because, uh, I grew up listening or reading, reading X-Men. I, you know, I've been an X-Men fan, you know, as, as are most people in my age group. Um, it was one of the first books that I picked up regularly. Um, might have been the very first book. Um, and that was back in the, the Jim Lee run, early, early Jim Lee run. Um, and I just loved it. I loved it. Um, so uh, over the years, my, my, my favorite X-Men has, has, has changed a lot. Uh, you know, back in the day, it was, it was probably, you know, your standard Wolverine gambit, um, then he evolved to Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler is still one of my absolute favorites. Well, uh, thanks for joining us on Geek History Lesson, Aaron. And can you tell our listeners uh, where they can find you on the internets? And then is there any hint you can give us about what you're working on next? <laughs> um, I have to try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you can find me at, uh, on Twitter at, at Aaron Cooter. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, just Aaron Cooter. I, I cannot disclose anything um, about what I'm working on, but it is so fun. It is allowing me to be able to draw things that uh, I've, I've really looked forward to doing for uh, my whole career. Um, flexing, flexing artistic muscles that have been primed and ready to go since day one. So, uh, and it's and it's lighthearted, fun stuff. So, uh, really, 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 really looking forward to it's, it's like the brightest light that's in 2017 so far. Mm, all right, listeners, we'll uh, put together the clues and let's figure it out together. And uh, thanks again, Aaron, for talking to us about Cyclops. Absolutely a blast. Thank you. 
All right, thanks, Aaron. That was a mutantastic conversation. It certainly was. Yes, but now it's time for school to be over. Aww. So let's move into the teaching tweet. Which is the final part of the podcast in 140 characters or less. Professor Jason will sum up everything that he just taught us about Cyclops. Scott Summers, Cyclops. Sometimes called Slim, called by me the greatest X-Man of all time. Ooh, I heard that mic drop. <laughs> nice, that's really nice. Go. Very simple. So uh, that's it, guys. Um, I want to thanks throw out a quick thanks again to all who suggested Cyclops uh, for this week's Geek History Lesson. Andrew Lewis Perry, Ellen Mendez, Robert Sussman, Ron Pertwee, Sean Leary, Captain Cuba, at Chris Punto 94, and Alex isn't Bowen, or Alex isn't Bowen. One of the two. Both. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for all suggesting. And if they want to suggest future episodes, Ashley, where can they do that? They can do that at geekhistorylesson.com or facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson. There are tons of ways to contact us in both of those places. And you can go listen to us on Audio Boom now, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and iTunes. And on iTunes, if you leave us a review, we'll read it on the air. Wait, what? Yes, because it helps other listeners find our podcast just like you. And we'll read it on the air just like this one. Uh, by TSW71. They say, fun and informative show. My eight-year-old son also loves it. I let him listen, despite the occasional expletive, which doesn't <laughs> happen anymore, uh, because he learns about the characters and he finds Jason's impressions and jokes hilarious. Ah, good taste. He has good taste. <laughs> oh, and Ashley's great, too. Oh, thanks. Don't let reviews from joyless individuals affect how you listen to the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, TSW71. Thank you. And don't forget, if you want to complain to us on Twitter, you can come find us at Jawin for me, at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and for Ashley, at Ashley V. Robinson. Her Twitter handle is much, much simpler. (laughs) Uh, And also support us on Patreon if you want to hear our episode about the best Leaders of the X-Men, patreon.com slash Jalen. It's a recurring theme here on the podcast. That's it for our lesson on Cyclops. Thank you all for listening. I am Jason, sometimes Sinister Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Jason, will you please take us away? X-Men, attack! X-Men, stop listening to Geek History Lesson.